Hello YouTube. Um, let's move on then, because I had planned to do uh, 13 through 21, uh, and as I spent a lot of time thinking about that section, that that uh, block of paragraphs, and um, you know, I think I'm probably going to be posting these somewhat weekly or something like that. And uh, I'd just like to read on next week, so I'm going to do this second video today. Um, so, at, we had a critique of, of Fichte and Schelling, right? Um, and then Hegel provides his um, overcoming, let's say, of these problems. Chapter 17 begins, In my view, which can, be, which can be justified only by the exposition of the system itself, everything turns on grasping and expressing the true, capital T, not only as substance, but equally as subject. This is hugely important. This is, and in some way, I think that this is what Hegel's... Um, idea of spirit really is. Um, so, Fichte and Schelling say, you know, in the absolute, A equals A, everything is self-identical, everything is one. Um, and Hegel says, okay, you're talking about the absolute as substance, as a thing out there, right? What you're not talking about is the absolute as a subject, right? As as uh, a mind, in a in a certain way. Mind you, I don't I don't know to what degree. In some way, I'm 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 split between the idea of whether or not Hegel means this literally, or whether he means it as a methodological tool, um, or I think probably for Hegel, those kind of turn into the same thing. Um, okay, then we get, or that's that's the most important part about it, paragraph seventeen. Um, Everything turns on grasping and expressing the true, not only as substance, but equally as subject, right? Then we get paragraph 18, which is, um, this is the, the real, I think, beginning of the Hegelian system. This is the first time he, like, actually talks about his, his system in, in any way. So this paragraph is really important. I'm going to read the whole thing. It's only a few sentences. Paragraph 18. Further, the living substance is being which is in truth subject, or what is the same is in truth actual only insofar as it is the movement of positing itself, or the mediation of its self-othering with itself. Pause there and explain what that means. Um, the movement of positing itself and the mediation of its self-othering with itself. So, imagine I look in a mirror, right? I see something staring back at me. I have to posit that that something is myself. Right. And imagine I were to think about that further and begin ascribing it uh, characteristics, right? You know, it's a nice guy. It's me, right? So imagine this were to happen. But no matter what I do, there's a gap between my subjective lived experience as myself and the other self, right? 
the other that I'm positing as myself, right? And that gap is, I think, the core of Hegel's system. This is, I think, the most important part of Hegel's system. Now, the self-mediation... Okay, that's the movement of positing itself, right? Or is the mediation of itself othering with itself? Now, the mediation, right, is I have posited th this thing in the mirror as being me. And then when I cognize that thing now that I have posited as myself, that changes me. Does that make sense? Like, I produce this image and then this image that I have produced in turn affects me. I have to reconcile this gap between the two. That is the mediation, right? Now, the only reason I use um, the idea of looking in a mirror is, is because I think that metaphor is going to come in handy a little bit later. Um, but Marx, for instance, talks about labor in this way. Um, and I think it's a useful tool of getting into Marx's philosophy, which obviously I'm not talking about here, but I think it's, this idea is useful of explaining why this is important for Hegel, right? So for Marx, it's not that I'm looking in a mirror and then positing myself. An artisan cobbler who puts his style and self and aesthetic into making shoes, right? Um, he puts his his being, his creativity, his, his energies into making a shoe, right? That's a, also a form of positing oneself, right? And then the cobbler looks at the shoe and it changes him in turn. So there's this relationship between the cobbler and the shoe, and the gap between the cobbler and the shoe is what has to be overcome, or it has to be uh, mediated. It has to be understood, right? Um, so that's an example of um, the movement of positing itself, or is the mediation of its self-othering with itself. Self-othering just means um, I put myself into something in the world, right? Um, this substance is, as subject, pure, simple negativity. And it is for this reason the bifurcation of the simple. Okay. Um, the absolute as a subject, if we think of it as a subject, is, is pure, simple negativity. That means that it um, splits itself, right? Um, you have, hmm, how to describe this? Um, Negativity for Hegel is the gap between me and the mirror. I'll put it that way. Right. So, as subject, it is pure, simple negativity. That gap is, constitutes what the absolute is as subject. And it is for this very reason the bifurcation of the simple. So again, I am just here, I'm dicking around and, and whatever. I am a self-identical subject. I'm, I am myself. Um, I am simple. I am without parts, right? But when I look in the mirror or when I make a shoe, um, I'm cut into two. And so I can see myself outside of myself. That's the bifurcation of the simple, the splitting in two of something. Um, and it, the mechanism by which that happens is negativity, right? Now, only this self-restoring sameness, 
or this reflection in otherness within itself, not an original or immediate unity as such, is the true. Okay. Self-restoring sameness, um, or this reflection of otherness within itself. What he means when he says sameness is the cobbler and the shoe, in some sense, share a sameness, right? The shoe can be thought of as the cobbler putting himself into the world, into this form, right? So it's at that level that it's sameness. Now, it's self-restoring in the act of mediation, right? In the act of the cobbler then understanding the shoe that he produced. So we have uh, three steps here, which is very typical of Hegel. We have being in itself, which is just the cobbler. Um, being out of itself, which is the making of the shoe. And being for itself, which is the cobbler then recognizing the shoe that he has made, right? And that is the self-restoring sameness, right? That mediation between the two. Um, and that's the reflection of otherness within itself, right? That it's, it's the same thing. It's this mediation. And he says that's the true, right? That gap and the uh, understanding of that gap, that's the true. Right. Um, rather than some self-identical simplicity. Um, uh, so in some way, it's not that the world is, uh, this might be metaphorical, right? But I, I have, well, it is metaphorical. I have a coffee cup and I have a lighter, right? The truth of the coffee cup and the lighter is not to be found in its essential coffee cupness and its essential lighterness, right? But rather the gap between the two of them, the difference in itself, right? So this is a very difficult concept to come to grips with, um, but but just bear with me, right? Um, so yeah, talking about the lighter and the coffee cup, we tend to think that that the difference is constituted by the sameness of the lighter and the coffee cup, right? The lighter is a thing unto itself, the coffee cup is a thing unto itself, and uh, it's those two samenesses that produce the difference. What Hegel is implying here is that the difference comes first, right? The difference is primordial. The difference is the true, not the sameness of the lighter and the coffee cup, right? It's implying that. That idea becomes really important in, uh, in 20th century continental philosophy. Um, but that's a really difficult idea to wrap one's head around, I think. It's a very interesting idea. Um, so yeah, that's only this self-restoring sameness or this reflection and otherness within itself, not an original or immediate unity as such is the true. It is the process of its own becoming. The circle that presupposes its end as its goal, having its end also in its beginning, and only by being worked out to its end is it actual, right? So the cobbler is not actual. Uh, he is he's abstract in a sense. He hasn't put himself into the world until he produces the shoe and then understands the shoe that he produces, right? That is the cobbler becoming a cobbler, right? Um, that's the actual, and that's what's missing, again, from Fichte and Schelling. Um, their philosophy doesn't contain this um, doesn't contain this dimension of struggle, right? and therefore it's not actual, it's abstract. So that is, mind you, that's the first, uh, 
really the first statement of what what becomes known as dialectic, right? Um, you hear this term bandied about in Hegel a lot, um, and it, let me assure you that everything that you think you know about dialectic, typically people will say thesis, antithesis, synthesis, that's not what Hegelian dialectic is, right? So uh, people often have the wrong idea of what it is. The point is the gap between the two. And it's not a synthesis between the two. It's a mediation between the two. It's, it's a reconciliation between the two. It's not a combination of the two, right? Um, but furthermore, there are other there are other problems with that model. But this here, paragraph eighteen, is the first place where we get anything that looks like dialectic. Um, paragraph nineteen. Thus, the life of God and divine cognition may well be spoken of as a disporting of love with itself. Right. So this is a very different uh, picture of God already. God as self-alienating. But this idea sinks into mere edification and even insipidity if it lacks the seriousness, the suffering, the patience, and the labor of the negative. Right? So that's what's lacking... Uh, that's in God, right? Like, that's, that's, um, the truth of God in a certain way for Hegel. Um, it's seriousness, seriousness, suffering, patience, and the labor of the negative. I don't want to say it's the truth of God. That's far too strong. But that's part of, uh, the picture of God that Hegel is constructing here. Um, in itself, that life is indeed one of untroubled equality and unity with itself, for which otherness and alienation and overcoming alienation are not serious matters, right? That's what God is in itself. But this in itself is abstract universality, in which the nature of the divine life to be for itself, so too the self-movement of the form are altogether left out of the account. So, Hegel says, okay, God is simple and self-identical. Fine. God is that in himself. But the question that Hegel is asking is, what is God for himself? How does God view himself? Right? How does God appear to God, right? And that is, is again, that, that's the highest level of being for Hegel. That's the, that's the highest aspect of being for Hegel. So, like, okay, he is sort of ontologically this simple self-identical thing, whatever, um, but that's not important. That's not, that's not what's interesting. What's interesting is how does God appear to himself? And how does God appear to us, right? So this f God for himself, in himself, his, is, his life is one of untroubled equality and unity with itself for which otherness and alienation and the overcoming of alienation are not serious matters. So that means that God for himself, God as he perceives himself, is not something of untroubled equality and unity with itself. Um, God for himself experiences otherness and alienation and the overcoming of alienation. So God experiences struggle at the level of being for itself, right? Um, God perceives himself as engaging in struggle and overcoming of alienation and blah, blah, blah. That's a very different picture of God. It's a much more complex notion of God. I mean, the question is whether or not it's God, right? The question is um, whether or not Hegel's God is identical with the properties that we typically conceive of as God. It seems to me to be 
shaky to say that. Or even if Hegel's God is supernatural. Seems to be a shakier case to make. Okay, besides the point. Um, yay, editing. Um, uh, so then Hegel goes on, after talking briefly about God. Uh, and he talks about um, consciousness is not satisfied with essence in itself. Um, but, or, um, just because the form is as essential to the essence as the essence is to itself, the divine essence is not to be conceived and expressed merely as essence i.e. as immediate substance or pure self-contemplation of the divine, but likewise as form, and in the whole wealth of the developed form. Only then is it conceived and expressed as an actuality. So, if something were to be totally self-identical, if something were to totally be unto itself and simple, without parts, right, as God is typically conceived, then it would have no form, right? It would just be pure substance. Um, and he says that that's not, you know, that's abstract. That's not, that's not a real thing, right? That doesn't, that, that's not good enough in a certain way. Um, and he says, you know, or just because the form is as essential to the essence as the essence to itself, the divine essence is not to be conceived and expressed merely as essence, um, but likewise as form, and in the whole wealth of the developed form. And only then is it conceived and expressed as an actuality. So God as something that's purely self-identical, like, sure, that might exist. God then contemplates himself, perceives himself. Even in we, when we talk about, um, I mentioned the cobbler making the shoe. You could imagine God making the world and recognizing himself in the world. Right. And it's only through that process that God becomes actual. Otherwise, it's just an abstract, not interesting thing. Right. Only through that process that God becomes God, for Hegel. Paragraph 20. The truth is the whole, but the whole is nothing other than the essence consummating itself through its development. Of the absolute, it must be said that it is essentially a result, that only in the end is it truly what it is, and that precisely and that precisely in this consists its nature, vis-a-vis -vis to be actual, subject, the spontaneous becoming of itself. So the absolute is something that comes at the end of a process. In some way, God is something that comes at the end of a process. God is not God until he has created the world and recognizes himself in the world. The cobbler is not a cobbler until he makes a shoe and identifies himself with the production of the shoe. So the the thing is is or being is something that emerges. Um which is again very different than Fichte and Schelling this notion of of you know the absolute everything is one in the absolute and everything else is just appearance and blah blah blah. blah which would be a Platonist idea as well. You know, the the notion that the complete form comes first is sort of this traditional idea in philosophy. Hegel wants to reverse that and say, no, 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 no. Like, it's not that there is some complete form to begin with or that what's interesting is at the beginning. What's interesting is in the fully articulated end point, right? That's the absolute for Hegel. Um, uh, it's like, you know, he mentioned in a previous, I mentioned in a previous video, the idea of if we see, if we want to see a tree, we're not satisfied when we look at the acorn, right? So God is something simple and self-identical is like the acorn here. The tree is, um, 
is 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 the tree, right? But it comes at the end. So God has to undergo this process of becoming before he can be actual, before he can be God, right? Um, the beginning, well, though it may seem contradictory that the absolute should be conceived essentially as a result, it needs a little pondering to set this show of contradiction in its true light. The beginning, the principle, or the absolute, as at first immediately enunciated, is only the universal. Just as when I say all animals, this expression cannot pass for a zoology. Right? So, all animals is the universal, the abstract universal. You, Hegel uses this term, the abstract universal, every now and again. So saying all animals is a version of that. It doesn't represent a zoology. Right. It's, it's it's not the it doesn't point to anything real, it's just something abstract and, and out there. Um so God as purely something simple is like saying all animals. Right. Um so it is equally plain that the words the divine, the absolute, the eternal, etc., do not express what is contained in them. And only such words, in fact, do express the intuition as something immediate. And when it, Hegel says immediate, he means not mediated, as in hasn't articulated itself. Um, whatever is more than such a word even the transition to a mere proposition contains a becoming other that's hyphenated, right? A becoming other. So, again, the cobbler producing the shoe, that's an example of a becoming other. Um, whatever is more than, su than such a word, even a transition to a mere proposition, contains a, a becoming other that has to be taken back or is a mediation, right? So... Everything contains this movement for Hegel. This is how Hegel is going to start to try and build a philosophy of everything that that describes everything, right? Is by this premise that this becoming other that needs to be then mediated um, is the core of everything. Um... But it is just this that is rejected with horror, as if absolute cognition were being surrendered when more is made of mediation than in simply saying that it is nothing absolute and it is completely absent in the absolute. So that mediation, uh, to say that God is simple, means that there is no mediation in God. There, is, there, is no, there are no parts right, in God. Um, uh, Hegel's saying the opposite. He's saying that that thing with no parts is not important. What's important is the end, as it mediates itself with itself over time. Um, but this, abhor this is paragraph 21. This abhorrence, in fact, stems from ignorance of the nature of mediation and of absolute cognition itself. For mediation is nothing beyond self-moving, self-sameness. So the cobbler making the shoe, there's a self-sameness there. The cobbler puts himself into the shoe. So that's self-moving, self-sameness. Um, or it is a reflection into self, which is the cobbler viewing the shoe. The moment of the moment of the eye which is for itself, pure negativity, or when reduced to its pure abstraction, simple becoming. Um, so the eye perceives itself as the gap between itself and the thing that is posited, like the shoe or God making the world. Or you can plug all these different examples into this formula, but um, the eye perceives itself as the movement um, that is produced by this gap. Um, and that's becoming. That's what it means to become. Um, to develop in the world, kind of. Um, uh, 
reason, therefore, is misunderstood when reflection is excluded from the truth. This is why I used the mirror example earlier. Reflection, right? Um, that's what he's talking about. He's talking again about that gap. Um, so reason is misunderstood when that gap between the cobbler and the shoe is excluded from the true. That is, when we conceive of the true as simple, reason is misunderstood. Um, it is reflection that makes the true a result. But it is equally reflection that overcomes the antithesis between the process of its becoming and the result. For this becoming is also simple, and therefore not differentiated from the form of the true, which shows itself as simple in its result. Um, the process of becoming is rather just this return into simplicity. So, I don't think that I can, I'm, I'm pretty sure if I unpack that, I'll just say, say the same things that I've been saying before. But this is where I wanted to end on 21. Though the embryo, because this is where you get the description of what he means by in itself and for itself, right? Though the embryo is indeed in itself a human being, it is not so for itself. This it is only, or thus it is only as cultivated reason which has made it, which has made itself into what it is in itself. And that is when it, for the first time, is actual. Um, so, an embryo in itself is a person, or is, is a human being, um, but, you know, birth happens, it grows up, it cultivates reason, and it develops some conception of itself. It, Self-awareness, right? It's aware of its own being. Um, that's what makes it actual, right? So this is the distinction between the in itself and the for itself. Being is only actual insofar as it is, as it appears for Hegel, right? So, again, going back to God, God is self-identical, sim simple idea. The classical God, let's call that. Um, that's like a human embryo. It's, it, it, it doesn't reflect back into itself yet, and therefore it's not actual. It needs to create the world in order to do that. Um, this result... But this result is itself a simple immediacy, for it is self-conscious freedom at peace with itself, which has not set the antithesis on one side and left it lying there, but has been reconciled with it. So, when the self, I think what he's getting at is when the self posits itself, Right? So being in itself, being out of itself, and then being for itself. Right? In that reconciliation, you have a mediation, yes, but it's at peace with itself. And therefore, it's its own kind of simplicity. Right? It constitutes a new form of simplicity. So this is what, you know, previously, um, he talks about the circle that presupposes its end as its goal. Um, this is what I think he's getting at. At the end of this process, things are reconciled, right? Things are, are sort of okay. They're still mediated, but they're sort of okay. So when spirit undergoes a shift, when, it, when, it, um, when there's a break and a new shape arises, right? it begins as something unformed and unarticulated and something basically simple. At the end, it's something that's fully articulated and at peace with itself, which is identical to the beginning, right? Because when it's at peace with itself, it, um, it's, it's become inert again, right? So the beginning and the end are identical. 
to everything in between that uh, is the process. Um, so yeah, the goal is as defective as the starting point in a certain way, um, which is a really nice idea. I like that idea. Um, so yeah, I hope that was edifying. Um, and I don't know how far I'm going to get in the next time, but it'll probably be up in like a week. Um, but that's like an hour of Hegel for you guys, which is a lot of Hegel for anyone to deal with. So take, take the next week, breathe, go out drinking with your friends. Have a good day. <laughs>